This is the CHGO Cubs podcast. My name is Corey. I am joined, as always, by Brendan. And Brendan, we are coming to you on Friday the 13th. We are. are. Which feels like you and I should not be allowed to record on a a cursed day. Give it. We we ruined Sundays for the entire (laughs) city of Chicago. Maybe this is how you break the Sunday curse. You have us on Friday the 13th. Yeah. Like, yeah, th- this has like Sunday, Jamison Tyone is pitching in July kind of vibes. Um, I've, I've moved on from that. I don't want to even yeah. relive that right now. Right. Uh, but welcome to the Friday, formerly the Sunday edition of the CHGO Cubs podcast with Brendan and I. We are uh, in the middle of the off season. obviously the MLB playoffs going on. We've got, uh, you know, it's been a lot of talk of locker room chirping and Bryce Harper staring and the Diamondbacks sweep and jump into their own pool this time in lieu of the Dodgers jumping into their pool. Um, Rangers, Houston, got a battle of Texas for the ALCS. So a lot going on in Major League Baseball. Uh, And of course, unfortunately, the Cubs are waiting, playing the weighing game. We've got a couple of uh, minor, perhaps, coaching changes that that came across for the Cubs that we can touch on a little bit. Uh, but Brendan, first question, uh, I'm curious, because I see people talk about this. It's, it feels like a natural question. Like, when you see the Diamondbacks advance to the NLCS, they beat the Dodgers, they sweep the Dodgers in, in extremely convincing fashion. Yeah. And, you know, this is a team that you were – competing with that, uh, you know, as we talked about a lot, you went one and six against in September that played a very large part in uh, not only them taking a wild card spot from you, but also the Miami Marlins. Does it bother (laughs) you to watch them succeed? Does it give you some sort of like, oh, well, at least we lost to a team that's playing well? How do you how do you feel when you watch a team that you know, we were in the thick of it with continue on in the MLB postseason? My first thought is, oh, that kind of makes sense to see them have the success. That was a tough lineup. I mean, you saw Corbin Carroll, uh, Marte, you know, they have guys that make a ton of contact and hit for a ton of power. And they have all these wonky arms coming out of that bullpen. And they have two top level pitchers in that rotation and an emerging guy whom, whose name I can never pronounce, Fott, I believe is how you yeah. pronounce it. Is that it? All right, nice. I think. I don't I think. know. Well, we're going with that. But that's We'll ask our friends at PHNX. Yeah, we can ask them at PHNX. But it's not surprising, you know? And they have a team that has some ups and downs throughout the years. They've had some pitching issues in the bullpen. They had Seawall at the trade deadline come over. So they shored up their pitching. But ultimately, when I see that happen, my first thought is, oh, that can be the Cubs next yeah. year. That can be a team going from the Valley, no pun intended, but 110 lost nice. team, not even pretty good, right? It's right off the cuffs of my head. Uh, and they can make the playoffs and potentially a World Series just 18 months later is insane. Yeah, I think I feel pretty similarly to when the Brewers got bounced, um, you know, in that I'm, you know, I'm a, like, there's part of you that it's hard not to be a little annoyed, right? And frustrated, like thinking like, man, you know, they're at their best, right? They, they could play with these teams, you know, no, like, no, and no. they, they could have been in this and, you know, had they gotten hot at the, and of course, I'm, I'm not like getting into like, would the bullpen have survived? Who would have started? <laughs> all? Like, that's not the point. The point is they were in the thick of these, the race with these teams, they, let it slip away, uh, largely, you know, of their own doing. And it's, it's frustrating, right? It's, it's not, I don't find it validating to watch the Diamondbacks go further, right? We knew they were a talented team and like had all this potential and stuff. Like it's more just annoying. It is a nice blueprint though, right? Like the way they're doing it, Corbin McCarroll, stability, Mm -hmm. two top level arms, right? Stability. Then you get emerging guys who didn't have the best projections, 
come out of nowhere. And they kind of had that happen. And they have a very, very deep roster and they have a deep bullpen right now too. So it is a blueprint and it does give me optimism that the Cubs can follow a similar path next season. Right. And uh, I like so, seeing them beat the Dodgers too and the Brewers. Yes. So I have, I have a degree of gratefulness. They, you know. they, they are taking out some of our enemies. Yeah, They're doing good they work are. in that regard. Although um, I do have a lot of D-backs trauma having grown sure. up in, yeah. in my teens in that area. We live so. to hate. I hate basically everybody. So, so do I. I yeah. love it. It gives me a lot of, no, of energy. Nobody's uh, nobody's off the hook. But yeah, no. I, no, I, I, I was just curious. Obviously, you know, again, the, the Cubs are in a period where they can only make so many moves. And we'll, we'll talk about one of those coaching changes uh, in a second here. Um, but you know, I think looking at the landscape of the league is, you know, ultimately part of the conversation, right? Like, um, you know, especially you look at a team like the Dodgers that is thought of in this elite level and in, in many ways as an organization, they are right. But you see them get beat by a team in their division that they won a lot more games then. And, and again, they, they got stopped in this series. And it, it does provide some context as you go forward, right? It's the, the MLB playoffs are not quite as, um, you know, I think people think of them in a predictable manner, right? No, Where it's like, not. well, if you're, if you're not at the level of the Braves or the Dodgers, you know, that's, you can't win. And it's like, well, that's just not really true, right? It like is. we're watching it. Every team that won all these games is getting knocked out and, it it does remind you that everything get, gets condensed in the playoffs, right? You don't necessarily need 28 guys to win in the playoffs. You need a much smaller portion than that. You're going to use the same relievers most of the time if the games are close. You're going to rely on sometimes three starters. I mean, we've seen teams try to do it with two, right? right? In terms of the guys that they are going to, you know, on short rest and really leaning on. And so it's just always a good reminder of that, that yes, you want to build an organization that that models the Braves in terms of developing young talent, locking them up, having a sustainable core that exists for a long period of time, the ability to win all those games in the regular season, because that's what guarantees you the ticket to the dance, but doesn't mean championships. Ultimately. Well, you look at that 2016 team that won the World Series, by the way, Who but the, the cops actually oh, 2016 okay. the cops yeah, yeah i know people people do forget that but yeah. that squad that offense for multiple stretches in october were not there right. I, against la and even against the giants in those last two games other than the ninth inning well in the world the series innings. they, they either the won series. games or didn't score any runs <laughs> yeah and if you look at just the projected wins versus the actual wins going into a season i always do this after each year I haven't done it yet this year but i compare What's the range of error that the projections have? Typically, it's one standard deviation is six wins or losses. That's an enormous amount of error for this. Mm -hmm. My thinking is, and always will be, get in that range of error and see what happens in the playoffs. Try your best yeah. to get those surefire top-level arms because it does limit some of the nonsense in a shrunken sample. But just get in, have a team with a ton of crazy attitudes, which I do think is why Philly's having success. Those guys are relentless. The Philly's chemistry guys. matters, man. It like matters. a team identity does matter, I think. Yeah. And it does. And you look at Harper and Schwarber and Castellanos and now Trey Turner. They they have that attitude where when it's a stressful situation, they 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 relish those opportunities. I yeah. do think those hitters combined with top level pitchers make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, also a good reminder and something that we've talked about, but, you know, a, you and I talked about, you know, what we'd like to see from David Ross going into 2024, given that the organization seems to have made the decision that they're going to be sticking with him, uh, much yeah. to, you know, again, the chagrin of a lot of Cubs fans, I think, uh, at least in well, our I'm a pro chat. David Ross guy, according to you. Well, listen, Go, you know, you read the it. tape. Um, yeah, go back and listen to Also that a good reminder, tape. we are not live, but we will read the chat. We will read your comments. If you go back to our episode on Friday, I've, you know, I'm, I'm in there. You can see me in the YouTube comments. So please leave any comments, questions, feedback, et cetera. Um, you know, Only good wanna... feedback. I don't want bad yeah, feedback. Right. Only good ones. Um, but it, it is one thing that is going to be important is 
managing guys so that they are able to get through the long, not only 162 game season, but also get deep into the playoffs. And I think in 2023, you obviously had a situation where it was kind of all hands on deck just to get there. Right. And we've debated and it's not, doesn't really serve a purpose as to, to continue to debate like, oh, should they have given guys rest? Should they not have given guys rest? Because you know, the 2023 season's over, the season's over, right? Whatever. But you looked at how, you know, Justin Steele, this was first, you know, first year with that full load, starting every game, pole to pole, you know, trying to pitch at that Cy Young level. And he didn't have his best starts when we got down the stretch, right? And that's one of those things where, you know, if you're planning to have division winning expectations, NLCS expectations, World Series expectations, guys have to be able to get there, right? They have to be able to pitch. And it's not always an easy thing to navigate. And I think it'll play into one of the conversations that we want to have today uh, about how do you manage prospect development in a year where you, your expectations are going to be raised, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a a preview of something that we do want to get into a little bit today. It's the off season. There's not a lot going on. Uh, So I thought it would just be an interesting discussion of if you're going to bring these guys up, if we plan to see PCA all the time, or even someone like Cade Horton, or if Alexander Canario is, you know, part of this mix, I expect some of the, you know, not maybe not those three, but some of these guys are are maybe, probably, hopefully going to be traded, right? Hopefully. Uh, So specifically who it is, I don't know. But when you're bringing up these young guys, how do you give them the proper environment to grow and adjust and become the players that people dream on them being if you need to be winning every game you're playing because you have to win the division and you have to get to the playoffs. And it pairs well with that same conversation of how do you make sure a guy like Justin Steele is able to not only have his best starts toward the end of September, but potentially toward November, right? As this season draws on and you're trying to win a World Series. Not an easy needle to thread. Right. And you're seeing that, you know, the Dodgers are a perfect example of, you know, they're widely lauded as one of the best run organizations and they were running out the, you know, human home run machine, Lance Lynn in an elimination game. So best laid plans, right? Like they they don't always work. I do think I would be remiss, right? And I think it, it does pair well with, you know, we got the, I talked about it with Cody and Ryan. Uh, in the studio earlier this week on the CHGO Cubs podcast, but um, we got the letter, you know, the annual letter from Tom Ricketts. That's your favorite letter. Right? My that favorite, you get. my favorite email. Um, Couldn't wait to open it up. Right, and we, I think it pairs well, you know, reading that, and we're not going to go through that again, whatever. Uh, but you and I are recording this. Uh, it's you know, this is the Friday, October thirteenth episode of the CHGO Cubs podcast. October 12th is the anniversary, Brendan, of the last time the Chicago Cubs won a playoff game. And that was in 2017. Has it been that long? It has been that long. It does feel like it, actually. We can reminisce on Wade Davis's unbelievable, heroic performance. The clap when he, you know, him and Wilson freaking out when they got Bryce Harper. Uh, We could do that. We could reminisce on John Lester's you know, the the greatest speech ever given in human history after the game, uh, a few, several, maybe bottles of champagne. What does this remind you of? Right. Do you know what I'm doing right now? Yes, of course. (laughs) And I appreciate you doing it off camera. I almost actually, almost actually did it, but yeah. Um, but as you know, Bryce Harper is, you know, leading the Phillies through these playoffs. I don't want to do that. Right. It, it has, it, 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 it sets the table for the conversation in that it being six years since they last won a playoff game, not their last playoff appearance, but their last playoff win, right? Unacceptable. We, Unacceptable. we talked about it in the last episode. The, you know, David Ross is on a one-year deal, right? So he, he will go into the season as somewhat, uh, people would say, a lame duck, potentially, if the team struggles out the gate, things like that. He's obviously going to be the first person everyone is looking at. If the team doesn't meet the expectations by the end of the year, first person everybody's going to look at. Duh, right? But I, I do think the reminder of them winning that national series does serve as somewhat of a kind of wake up call, right? It, for And everybody has those expectations, but it's like, it has been six years. Not only have the Brewers been running all over you 
in this division and everything since, you know, 2018, right? And we're watching the Diamondbacks go to the NLCS after beating you for a wild card spot, but you haven't won a playoff series. You haven't won a playoff game in six years, Brendan. It it just isn't going to cut it. The, the expectations when we break Mesa next year have got to be through the roof. They have to be. And we understand why they weren't for the last couple of years. And it's not to say that the intent to have built a sustained winner wasn't there in 2019, 2020, even with some of the budget restrictions. I understand that. But the intent is typically there to build a consistent winner, to develop long-lasting players that are team-controlled for six-plus years. They just weren't able to do it, and it does open up the conversation after this year if they aren't approaching juggernaut territory, then you do have to question, is Jed's front office and the staff the right guys going forward? And you saw it even, maybe we'll get into it, but even letting go some major league coaches on the pitching side, despite you and I talking mostly favorably about the major league pitching, they still make changes. And it does open the conversation that despite some of the overall good, that the front office has done. Despite the direction looking as if it's going forward, it still might not be enough. And there are executives and coaches who are talented but just need an opportunity. And you pointed out it might be Jed or it might be Ross that we look to first at the end of the season if things don't work well. For me, that won't be the case. If things don't go well in 2024, the first person I'm looking towards is is Jed. Even if I agree with a lot of the moves and a lot of the direction the team is going. Well, I, I, I we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Um, but we're, as I said, we're already lamenting. Well, as, as I said last months. week, whatever anybody thinks, the first person that's always looked at is the manager. Um, yeah. But I I think it depends on how how this goes. It, it you know coming into the 2023 season. We felt like, and I think you could make a a strong argument, right, that the roster had pretty obvious flaws and David Ross, for some uh, of IB and and others, you know, his flaws, right, he he wasn't given the best hand in a lot of respects. Well, they also also failed, too. Like, he wasn't given the best hand as the intention was to build some of the triple a pitching depth sure yeah but i'm not i'm not getting into the weeds on this again that that wasn't the point the point was that if it, in this season you could at least make some of those excuses if you're looking at david ross just specifically i think a lot of people expect that as we head into 2024 the roster may not have those excuses or at least it better not right and that's what I mean when I say we'll see yeah. how it goes. If we feel like Jed delivers the roster that a lot of us are hoping he does and that levels up this team, then yeah, you're going to have to look at David Ross if it doesn't work. If we still look at this roster and say, well, you know, y- you still have this very questionable bullpen that you didn't fix or you lost Bellinger and didn't add on to the then yeah, of course, you know, it would be a front office thing. But I, I think if if they deliver in the way that I expect them to in terms of how they build this roster for next year, it's it's absolutely going to be David Ross that is under the microscope. Uh, and, you know, for a lot of people, he's already very much under that microscope yeah. when you're looking back at a team that it. barely missed the playoffs and thinking of games that perhaps you didn't like the way he managed. And again, I'm not, we're not relitigating that. But that was my point. I, uh, I get it. I do. I do want to get into before we hit our first ad break here. Let's just do these uh, quick coaching changes because I don't know that. Uh, here, here's the thing with this. So the the two coaching moves uh, that came earlier this week: uh, bullpen coach Chris Young and catching and game strategy coach Craig Driver, um, will not be returning. Um, Craig Driver has served a few different roles. Uh, he was also a first base coach at one point, uh, I believe before Mike Napoli took over, but these are two guys that have been with Ross since the outset of him taking over as the manager. Um, this is a tricky one, Brendan, because it's one of those things where we don't really know what any of these people do, right? Like they can tell us what their role is and what their job is, right? But 
Chris Young is the bullpen coach. Is it his fault that the bullpen wasn't good? Uh, we don't know. Probably not. But like, we don't know, right? Like, what exactly are these guys doing on a day to day basis? And I don't really mean to say you and I don't know that. Like, nobody really knows that. Uh, this is day to day team operation stuff that there is not always a clear answer on, right? So, um, I think in general, like the Cubs catching has been uh, always, I think, a, a, a bright spot on these teams. Um, I think you look at even though a, a lot viewed his uh, metrics in terms of like framing and things like that as not the best, like Wilson Contreras did make improvements over the years uh, within this organization and continue to show better numbers in that regard. And, you know, Craig Driver would have been one of the people who was heavily involved in that. Yeah. Um, we have seen the Cubs have success with a bullpen that they don't usually invest a lot in. Does Chris Young get some credit for that? Does he get the blame for the bullpen falling apart this year? I don't really know, but interesting, I guess, at least that the Cubs have identified a couple of areas where they would like to get fresh voices and see some change as we head into this next year. I don't mind it either. I, without knowing exactly what they're doing, my viewpoint is always get new people within the organization, get new people up on the major league squad. Now keep the general cohesion and the direction uniform and consistent, but the more outside voices you bring in that direction and uniformity can continue to evolve. They were there for multiple seasons. Again, who knows how involved they were with some of the bullpen damage at the end of the season. But the sport has changed in three years. You do have yeah. a pitch clock. You do have continuous development. Even within the Cubs front office, they have a new like biokinesiology type direction. They've hired what they call baseball scientists, which is an interesting name, but they have hired those why, folks. Why are they not poaching you? Do we know? You know, that's a great question. I think ultimately they look at this show and they, they think I'm too crazy, probably, which is fair, which is probably fair. But they do have those departments. If they ever came calling to me, I would I would say no. So maybe maybe that's why they know I would just say no. That's why. Thank Greg goodness Gordon. for they, that. Why? Because you want to talk to, uh, to me all the time? Is that why? No, I do. <laughs> could we... Uh, look. Could we all trust you? I, I don't know. About well, that's that. the issue. I'm too biased. I have too much emotional connection. They'd to be waiting team. for you to, you know, develop something <laughs> for Justin Steele, and you're busy looking at Nico Horner's pants. Well, you know, there is a correlation to Nico's development and right. Jersey tailoring. Uh, but th I mean, that's just to wrap up that that point. <laughs> I think I think it could be one of those things where they just want better alignment, and it's not even to discount the contributions those guys made. Sometimes you just got to move on, accept the good, yeah. take the good they brought over, keep that going and continue to layer onto that. And I'm cool with it. Yeah. I, I think it's a good point about, you know, the paradigms in this game change constantly, right? The way we think about everything yeah. in this game, uh, the way front offices operate is constantly changing. Um, and it's, it's, it's not to say that that's, why they made these changes they didn't report you know, anything generally. like you know so they're just making the change but um i think yeah in general like changing things up a bit especially when as a team the results weren't there you know never a bad thing i think ultimately like again like without knowing exactly what these guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis it's hard to feel really strongly about it i think yeah. you know in terms of like coaches like the manager the pitching coach and you know look we've seen the Cubs change hitting coaches 5,000 times since you and I have started doing podcasts together like from year to year did we feel like oh man wow you know thank thank heavens they made that change right like no like well you knows, were a big Chili right? Davis guy back in the day don't say that <laughs> you know I will I will say there were a lot of issues with that era but Javi Pius did, did come into his zone with Joey Davis when he opened up his stance and and developed a calmer a calmer approach. That's all I'm gonna say. Right. I was not a Joey Davis guy though. And the record David Ross that. apologist, Chili Davis no, don't apologist. Even put those words in my mouth. Doctor Brendan Miller. Yeah, that's me, I guess. All right. Um, but yeah. Anyway, like 
again, without knowing exactly what these guys do or what they were specifically responsible for, right? Like it's, it's tough to feel strongly about it, but they are making some changes. And, uh, I think the, the takeaway from me, I think of our thoughts on it would be that sometimes that can be a good thing, right? Getting new yeah. voices, new ways of thinking, just different sets of eyes to look at something, yeah. um, can be a good thing. And, and that doesn't mean that these guys didn't play an impact and that their loss can also be felt in certain ways. You know, these guys have been here for several years. They're, uh, likely well liked yeah. in the clubhouse and respected and guys that, um, you know, the catchers lean on, uh, in driver, the, the pitchers lean on and, in, in Chris young, but, uh, you know, hopefully they can find new folks. Um, I'm just going to throw it out there. I'm assuming he doesn't want to do this, but I, I feel like John Lester could sit in the bullpen for nine innings um, and have a decent time, right? Is that is that a crazy thought? All right. I uh, think we had some tef- technical difficulties there uh, in case you were staring at Brendan's it w- frozen it w- face. It was my fault. I'm sorry. Uh, but the last thing I was saying before we hit our ad break here is if David Ross is looking for people to fill one of these roles, I feel like John Lester could sit in the bullpen <laughs> for nine innings. He's already giving tips to Justin Steele about what pitches he should be throwing. I would love that. I think John is just living his best life. I Living know. the best retired life. He doesn't want to maybe, do it. Maybe in the future. Yeah. Maybe the Cubs need him, though. Maybe he'll come back just to help the Cubs and sacrifice his retirement to do it. You never know. Great. All right. Let me do this ad break here, and then we'll get back into this. First one is from our wonderful sponsor, Circa Sportsbook. Games will strive to be at a minus 110 split on the Circa Sports menu, unlike other sports books which may use minus 115 or minus 120. And there are, in Circa Sports does not limit players based on their winnings. Every player has the same limits, unlike other books who do limit winning players. We encourage bettors to download and explore all sports betting apps available, compare the lines from each sports book. And there are real people behind the Circa Sportsbook brand who resolve issues, if you do have them, in the timely fashion, unlike other books who use chatbots. So download the Circa Sports Illinois at circasports.com slash Illinois app to sign up today. Also be on the lookout for Circa events, watch parties, and tailgates. And if you or somebody you know may have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER, 1-800-426-2537, text GAMB to 833-234, or visit areyoureallywinning.com. Second ad break here from our sponsor, Splash Sports. CHGO has a weekly pick X and NFL Survivor contest for everyone to participate for real money. Head to splashsports.com slash CHGO. Link is in the description to sign up. Deposit cash to get started, and it's just $10 to enter. We'll be running a weekly contest all year, so be sure to keep that link Handy, and if you want to run your own contest, and if you're tired of being the commission on leaks, chasing people down with none of the reward, you can sign up to be a commissioner right now through our link and earn money for the contest you're already running with friends and family. Head to splashboards.com slash CHGO to join in. We'll have different contests coming out, so we are stoked to compete with and against you all, and be sure to click that link in this description. All right, Brendan. So let's uh, jump into what we were alluding to before, and I think is an interesting conversation uh, as we go forward here. So I think one of the challenges for this team, obviously, they they need to build a better roster. That's that's the simplest thing, but we know that, right? Are they going to prioritize re-signing Cody Bellinger and adding on top of that? Are they going to lose Cody Bellinger to another team and have to not only replace his production, but increase it as well elsewhere via trades, free agency, however they decide to do that? Not sure. We'll see how they decide to approach that. The one thing we do know 
right, is that they need to get better. That's the one thing that we've talked about. Everybody that covers this team has talked about. And whether you believe it or you scoff at it as you read it, that's what Jed said in his presser. That's what Tom Ricketts said in his end of, you know, end of season email, like not good enough, not making the playoffs isn't good enough. We need to be winning. We need to be competing for championships. That's where this 2024 team needs to get. I think one of the key issues to that is going to be how how does this team put their young prospects in a position to succeed and compete and help this team? How do you balance that while you are trying to win? Because we saw some of the uh, struggles with that toward the end of the 2023 season. You had a few things at play, right? The first was David Ross's, uh, and again, it comes from him, how much input the front office has is up to you to decide, right? The hint is that it's a lot, but maybe not total, right? Uh, But his decision to play the guys that had got them there, as was his sort of, uh, by the end of the year, infamous phrase, right? Um, Because they they were the ones that had gotten them out of being 10 games under 500 and then played them into that spot. And that's who he trusted. Right. But then you had that sort of counterbalance with, we saw some real flashes, obviously from Alexander Canario's bat, um, you know, some, you know, a grand slams, just a massive potential that we saw there in, in some of those plate appearances. They bring up PCA for his defense, his speed, but really struggled at the plate, which is totally, you know, fine for a young guy coming up and being thrust into that position. Uh, But it does beg the question, like, how do they set themselves up to be more successful at that? Because when you looked at PCA in particular, he was clearly struggling at the plate. And and if he was going to get there, he needed more time, right? He was behind, late, chasing some major league fastballs, right? Yeah. The only way to get there is to continue seeing and hitting major league fastballs. But when you are living and dying with every game, as the Cubs were toward the end of last year, how do you do that, right? Yeah. You don't have the time for it. So hopefully next year, obviously, you're in a position where you aren't necessarily like living and dying with every single game because the margin of error is so slim. But I think as we head into this offseason, it is an important question to ask. How do they build a roster that is able to integrate those guys and allow them the opportunity to succeed? It's going to be tricky because we have competing expectations. The first expectation is this team should be a clear division winner next season. At the same time, the expectation is that this front office should build a, a farm system that is also top tier and we should be graduating prospects that are contributing to this clear-cut division winner. The difficulty in those two expectations is that there's not a clear anchor in the middle of the order to outweigh some of the risk in, let's say, promoting Canario or PCA and letting them play with the expectations of 500 plus plate appearances. There is a possibility they struggle and the decision to go into the season devoting 500 plus plate appearances is a risk if you want to limit some of the randomness and decrease your chances of being that surefire division contender. So you look at free agency, you look at trade chips, You look at the potential of guys like PCA, and Jed has such a difficult task to accomplish balancing all that. You can look at Cody Bellinger. Everyone wants to bring Cody Bellinger back. Everyone, a better way of saying this, knows they need to match his value and add more onto that roster. It's a difficult task. The problem that Jed will have to figure out is other teams need center fielders and are willing to pay Cody Bellinger a Scott Boris asking price to play center field. If the Cubs want to bring Cody Bellinger back, they may have to pay him center field money 
to play first base knowing they have a Dansby type potential center fielder value waiting in the wings. So right. it's balancing, okay, what is the likelihood PCA is going to struggle at the big league level? And is that going to inform how you go out in free agency and try to get Cody Bellinger and then some back? It's difficult. It's a really difficult task. And in some aspects, it does like keep me up at night. I think we all want to be a juggernaut, clear-cut division winner. But this is a difficult task to accomplish given the current state of the roster. Yeah. I, I mean, I think obviously the easiest way to do this is, as you said, building a middle of the order that is relentless, right? And you look at some of these teams, you know, even in the playoffs still, the Braves, the Phillies, like, you know, even the Phillies in particular, like a lot of people gave them flack for signing a bunch of guys and sort of just being like, well, we'll figure out how they play defense later, right? Because like Cassianos doesn't rate very well. Schwarber has to DH a lot, right? Because he's not a good defender, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, Bryce, Bryce is hurt, first so now base. he's playing first base, yeah. right? But ultimately, like, you you mitigate some of that risk, right? And defense is very important, but you mitigate the risk when you're integrating a guy like Alec Bohm or Bryson Stott, right? Or uh, I think they've had Rojas playing in center, right? Like, you mitigate that risk because you're going to lean on those other guys. You're going to be like, all right, well, Bryce, Nick, Kyle, JT, Real Muto behind the plate. You guys carry the offense, right, yeah. in case— some of these other guys don't work around you, but you build that core that allows you to say, well, hopefully these guys work and then we can change the lineup. They can hit third for all we care, but if they're hitting ninth and going through some growing pains, it's fine because these guys are going to do the heavy lifting. And right now, as we sit here, the Cubs don't have those guys. They have a lot of nice complimentary pieces, some guys that have taken those steps, but without Cody Bellinger, Brendan, this picture gets it it is a tough needle to thread. I always I always <laughs> like that phrase. Uh, and again, it doesn't mean that they it has to be Cody Bellinger, right? But you the offense wasn't good enough in that position with him, yeah. right? So you yeah. you you see how it gets difficult. But I do see your point about if you want PCA out there, you know where where is he playing but every day? It, things like that. It becomes a question. Well, how realistic is it to get those? three and four hitters on this roster via trader free agency. Mm -hmm. I would imagine it's going to be extremely challenging. You and I always talk about where are the trades? We haven't seen the trades in quite some time. And I believe this is correct. I'm not entirely sure, but I think the last big trade from the prospect uh, pipeline was Jorge Soler for Wade Davis in like 2017. You can, you can jog your brain in case I'm missing anyone, but that was kind of basically it so it's those deals are very rare across this sport even though you do see teams acquire like a Mookie Betts and trade for the Juan Sotos and all of that right but it is very difficult and you're asking this front office to go out and get Cody Bellinger type value plus one and that plus one is maybe even asking for someone better than Cody Bellinger, or rather someone with a less volatile projection. It is very difficult. So then my assumption is it's not going to happen, which <laughs> which is okay. You can still, in my mind, you can get Cody Bellinger and then shore up the pitching side, and maybe you can still, with this division, be that clear-cut winner. But if you assume it's not going to happen, then the question is, well, can PCA be a consistent contributor for 2024 and are you willing to go through the growing pains as a fan right. with them there when will be gro as a team there will well, be growing pains with pca yes and so you know it's it's always easy to relate things back to the 2016 chicago cubs why is that world series oh, okay. um but you know you look at and obviously things changed as you went into the year but you look at their their opening day lineup in anaheim uh, to start the 2016 season. And you can kind of see a general idea of what we're talking about. Now, obviously you had more experience from these guys. You were able to get them a lot of really big and crucial experience. They went to the NLCS, right? The yeah. year before, uh, Chris Bryant won the rookie of the year. So you're, you're dealing with different things, right? But 
in that off season, they bring in, and again, it didn't work this way, but the thought process was there with Jason Hayward and one of the most consistent professional hitters ever, right? Like in Ben Zobrist, I mean, the, the way Very he put up that slash line too. every year was yeah. remarkable, right? But you look at the way they started, Dexter Fowler, Jason Hayward, Ben Zobrist, and by that point, Anthony Rizzo is a pretty well-established player in this league, right? That's how they started things. They did, On opening day, they hit the reigning rookie of the year and the guy who would go on to win the MVP fifth in that order. That's yeah. sort of the That's sort of the point, right? And then you have guys like... Soler and Russell hitting at the bottom of that lineup because you can afford it, right? Or at least that's the plan going in. Obviously, again, Chris Bryan ends up being their best player. You change the lineup, yada, yada. That's the goal, right? That you bring these guys up and it's like, oh, great. We have another four hitter. Wonderful, right? It's just to illustrate that going into that season, they built in more like damage reserve control. yes we built a better reserve we we are going to trust a lot of guys that only have a year or less than a year of experience no matter how good they were in 2015 no matter the amazing playoff moments they provided in in 2015 they still don't have a lot of experience we're not positive the players that they yeah. are and for a lot of them right it, it didn't end up working out for that long so you build in that that sort of uh you know a place to land, a soft landing in that lineup to yeah. sort of give you more assurance. Hey, if this guy doesn't work out or he needs time to hit at the bottom of the order to adjust to a certain handedness of pitcher or he's not seeing off-speed pitches well, fine, because we just paid Ben Zobrist a lot of money to be Ben Zobrist, and he's going to handle that at the top of the order or wherever we decide to put him. Again, you you had a better plan with Hayward that didn't work out, but you thought you were getting a guy that would be a little more consistent than that, right? So it's all just to say that's where the Cubs need to be. Because even if you look at some of the strides that some of these guys took, you know, Nico Horner's around, you know, a slightly above league average hitter, doing everything else incredibly around the diamond, right? That's for Dansby sure. Dansby Swanson ended up closer to league average than he would like. He would tell you that, right? He's talked a lot about wanting to come through in, in August and September more, but that's that's where that's he finished. what his projection was, too. Yes. Uh, again, slightly above league average, great, elite, all all these other areas, right? Ian Happ has has developed into a nice player. Seiya Suzuki ended up as as one of the best hitters in the league over the last couple months of the season. But, but... that's a small sample, right? Yeah. Do we know who he is? Do we know who he's going to continue to be, right? These are questions. Your catcher going into next year is 36 years old, right? So what this lineup needs is more protection for these young guys. Right. And that's the that's the hope. Which doesn't sound, and I, and I know that doesn't sound like a novel concept, but I think like sometimes people would look at some of the way the offense performed and be like, you know, there were a lot of games they were good enough, and the bullpen fell apart, or the starters didn't go deep, etc. And it it's it's not to necessarily argue that. It's to say if you want to get through a 162 game season, win the division, and compete with these teams in the playoffs, where likely you're going to be facing one to two ace type guys, one to three, right? To try to win these series, this is what where this offense needs to level up to, to get beyond and what did they win? 83 games? 82 83 games? games? 83 games. Uh this is where these are those steps you need to take. Yeah. If you look at PCA's projection, okay, it's it's all over the place. When you start projecting these young guys, there's a degree of confidence that's just not there. So you can take it all with a grain of salt. But if you look at what he's currently doing, you see how he needs to improve. And I have a chart here. If you're on the, the Apple, I know, if you're on the Apple or Spotify. Like it's been a while. Feed, it's been a while. Well, you know, the Cubs have caused me significant issues over the past few weeks here. So I'm normalizing. I'm back. I'm getting back to it. But if you look at a graph of contact and home runs, on the bottom or x-axis, you have contact rate on the y-axis, or as you go up on the graph, you have home runs. What you're looking at here is a very intuitive type result. If you make more contact, you tend to hit fewer home runs. If you make less contact, 
you tend to hit more home runs. That's how it is. All you stat nerds out here are going to look at this and be like, oh, it's linear regression on two variables. This is not how it is. Listen, I made this in legitimately who, who, 100 seconds. Who is seconds. that? What Dude, person is that? <laughs> you would be surprised, man. I have gotten comments over the years. You'd be surprised. There are some psychotic people out there worse than me. But if you look at uh, what typically guys who make similar contact to PCA hit for a home run tally, I'm highlighting this on the graph here in a big red oval. Most guys who make 70% contact typically hit over 20 home runs. And PCA right now makes 70% contact in Triple A. And the expectation he can hit over 20 home runs at the big league level is a huge task. You have to get to the point where you removed my chart without me finishing, but I understand oh, I that. Sorry, that's fine. That's fine. Well, but the if folks you, on YouTube just can't see us, so. I well, you know, sometimes they don't want to see us. I hate to say yeah. it. Uh, but if you just move down the chart to the right, the guys who make a ton of contact, those are the guys who are actually more projectable and stable. That's why someone like. Ben Zobris in years past, and Nico Horner going forward, you have a tighter degree of confidence in projecting their offense. The guys who whiff a lot and a lot of home runs, typically they're difficult to project. This is all to say with PCA and the Cubs 2024 season. If you go into the year slotting him in a 500 plate appearances, you can see the risk. The risk is currently... He needs to make more contact, and if he just applies his current contact rate from AAA to the big league level, which we just saw in Matt Mervis, who made 80% contact in AAA, comes over to the big leagues and makes like 65%, it's not likely. And if you want to be that clear-cut division winner, you need an insurance policy for PCA despite that future value of 60 plus on the 80 scale you need an insurance policy and an insurance policy has to be a big one Corey. yeah so i think you know for for me i feel like the takeaway from that is that pca needs the time to develop right in for order sure. to become that hitter the idea of just thrusting him in there like they did in september right? And expecting him to be that player is crazy, right? He, he's a young guy. It's a crazy thing to expect. He was a, he's a very young player who, again, as we said a lot, like was striking out at a rate in the minors that maybe probably wouldn't have gotten him called up except they wanted to use his skill set, right? Yeah. Which, which gives him as a player a very high floor, right? He's going to be an elite defender. He's going to be an elite base runner, things like that. But you saw it even with the base running, right? You need time to acclimate to the major leagues. And when you're in the middle of a pennant race, you don't have that time, right? So him adjusting to major league pickoff moves and catcher timings and things like that, you don't have time for it. Yeah. Got to got to be ready for it, right? And that's yeah. not his fault, right? It's the situation he was put in. But it's all to say when you go to 2024 with the, the the development he needs to make to get to that point where we're not just talking about his floor, right? And his defense and his base running and stuff like that, but he's putting it all together with the hitting and and just this bona fide star, right? He's going to need the time to get there. If he's going to get there, he needs the time. And so when you look at how to build this roster, again, bolstering that middle, the top and middle, so that it is it is a run-producing machine, right? A well-oiled machine. But also you need, as you just said, a, a better insurance. And I think someone that helps him with those matchups, right? So Mike Talkman was really good for the Cubs. The Cubs got an incredible season of production out of Mike Talkman, right? But do you look at, again, he's going to be very cheap in arbitration. I think like $2 million, like definitely love to have Mike Talkman back. He gives you very professional plate appearances, has a good two eye. two-win player last year. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that, that's a no-brainer. He's an yeah. excellent like bench, you know, platoon type yeah, player. Yeah, he's a good fourth, fifth outfielder. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but I think you, you'd like to be in a position where you have, somebody potentially who hits right-handed who does really well against lefties right 
so that Ross is able to kind of massage those matchups, you know, assuming PCA is breaking camp with the team. I don't know what their plan is, right? You may not. Depends how they construct the roster. I don't know, yeah. right? He could be traded for all I know. I don't think so, but, you know, who knows, right? You never know. But ha having more of a, a space, right? Because when you're looking at that toward the end of the year, when he came up, Mike Talkman had gone through a stretch where he was quite cold, right? Still giving you professional at bats, seeing pitches, things like that. But his overall numbers were not very good. Well, your only other choice, right, was to move Cody Bellinger to center field and put somebody out of position at first base or throw in a, a rookie who also hits left-handed who doesn't appear ready to hit major league pitching and yeah. you don't have the time to figure it out. That's a position you'd like to avoid right? Yes. Like you'd like the option in center field to be better than that. Again, if it's not Cody Bellinger and again, it gets tricky. Is that how you want it? Then you have to have somebody that's playing first base. It's, it's complicated. It's complicated, but it's all just to say that the, the setup they had at the end of the year is not an ideal one for either the team trying to win, right? Or the young player trying to develop and you need a, a better climate than that. Well, if that is going to be a similar setup in 2024, then guys will be fired. Like, no no doubt about that. It's a completely unacceptable outcome. Let me do this ad break here. We'll get back to this uh, break here from Charlie the Bacon Guy. I need, I've seen pictures of Charlie's Bacon, Corey. I, I need someone to send me the treats out to California. Where are they? I haven't seen them yet. You need the bacon jam. Let me tell you. I, that. Okay, I, yeah. I I've seen it. I I definitely need it. Charlie the Bacon Guy is based out of Woodridge, Illinois, and he makes craft bacon and bacon jams in over thirty different flavors. The product is always all natural, no fancy preservatives. You can order lots of bacon. It's vacuum sealed and freezes great. The bacon lasts in the package up to forty five days in the fridge and six months in the freezer. The bacon jam lasts about sixty days in the fridge. Or about 20 seconds, I guess, in all you guys' house out there in Chicago and in the studio. But it does last up to six months in the freezer as well. Some of the favorites are the maple pepper, the French toast, the chorizo, a lot of different flavors. The bacon jam goes perfect in anything. Scrambled eggs, toast, crackers, burgers, grilled cheese, or Charlie's favorite, just the spoon. He would deliver it to you, meet you halfway, or even ship it. Maybe Charlie can meet me out in San Diego. That would be kind of nice, actually. Uh... Maybe not. He will get you, though, the bacon on time, and you can contact him personally at Instagram at Charlie the Bacon Guy, on Twitter at CZ the Bacon Guy, or you email him, Charlie the Bacon Guy at gmail.com, and his website is coming soon. And second break here from our sponsor, Ray CDJR. Are you in the market for a new vehicle? If you are, then we have some great news for you. Ray Chrysler, Dodge Jeep, and Ram in Fox Lake have just joined the CHGO team at Ray CDGR. You'll always be able to shop one of Chicagoland's largest inventories and find unforgettable savings right now during Ram Power Days at Ray CDJR. Only in Fox Lake, you'll be able to secure 0% financing or 17% off new Ram models, but that's not it. Now through October 31st, explore their newly renovated showroom and take advantage of limited time seven-year anniversary savings. So if you're in the market for a new vehicle, then you have to check out the team at Ray Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram because they are the only team we recommend. Visit them today on Route 12 in Fox Lake. For more information, visit Ray C D J R in Fox Lake or RayCDJR.com today. Serving the community since 1963. All right, Brendan. Um, back to that conversation. Uh, it, it also reminds me too, like part of this was, you know, Strowman's injury and Tyone being inconsistent is a, a fine word for it, yeah, right? That's fine. Um, but they weren't set up for it on the pitching side either, right? Because like you look <laughs> at someone like Jordan Wicks, right? Yeah. If Jordan Wicks had struggled and you said, well, again, the answer to all of most things, prospects don't always work, players don't always pan out, et cetera. It happens, right? But the, the real true only way for these things to happen is to do it at the major league level, 
right? If you can't put away major league hitters, let's say Jordan Wicks with his changeup, and this is hypothetical because he obviously had a very good season for, for a rookie. If he comes up in first few starts and he can't put guys away, right? They're laying off the changeup and they're feasting on the fastball, right? Yeah. The only way to figure that out, you can do your bullpens, you can look at the data, you can figure it, you have to execute it against major league hitters and major league lineups, right? So if he had struggled and the Cubs are a game up, yeah. a game down, two games up, two games down of a playoff spot, what are they going to do? They're going to yeah. let him keep struggling, right? They're lucky that he was just really good and that Javier Assad was just really good, right? And again, if Stroman is healthy and pitching like at an all-star level like he was at the beginning of the year, if Jamison Tyone is more like the guy that you you know thought you were getting in New York, you do have a little more room for that, right? Especially as Justin Steele throughout the summer is pitching at a Cy Young level. But it's the same kind of conversation as with these hitters, right? You need to have the space for them to make these adjustments. And I think that's going to be an important thing uh, for this team to figure out as we go into building this roster and and into this offseason. Again, we don't know the players that they're necessarily planning on integrating at this level, right? Is Jordan Wicks going to be given a rotation spot? I would expect so, but I don't know the answer to that. Do they plan on Javier Assad also being in that mix? Is he a long reliever? Is he a trade candidate? These are questions they have to answer, but you have to not only build the roster that can blow teams out, like Jed has always talked about, and that is set up to go deep in October, but if you want these young guys to contribute, you have to have a landing space for them. And I think it's always a good you know person to look at, right? And we, we talked about him just a second ago. Chris Bryant is an exception to the rule, right? He came up and almost instantly was just one of the best hitters in the league. And from I, we always used to run through this stat, right? Wore it into the ground. Like from 2015 to 2019, there were two better players on, on the position side than Christopher Lee Bryant, Mookie Betts and Mike Trout. And KB yeah. did that basically immediately, right? Not the first game, but like hit the ground running and was just that guy, right? That's very rare. It's extremely, extremely rare. And in, in the 2015 season, that team had modest expectations. They ended up blowing them out of the water, right? But I don't think anybody was looking coming into the 2015 season as like, oh, this is, you know, division or NLCS or bust, right? Like not at all. It was like 85 plus wins. So the expectations were there, right? The, the tricky part with this upcoming thing is the expectations better be there right? Like it's easier for the young guys if they're not, but for everybody else, they better be. That's the, the whole point. The tricky part too, which sometimes is understated, but Rizzo's 2014 almost had a 400 Woba. So you went into 2015 with Cody Bellinger's bat already as a surefire guy, mm -hmm. the equivalent of a Cody Bellinger type bat, right? So the Cubs need to get that and as we just said, expectations were modest for 2015. We're always talking in parallels here, but it is, it is a good way yeah. to, to talk about this. You need to get a Rizzo-type 400 Woba bat in the lineup. Where is that? And, and there is a conversation to be had with Cody Bellinger, despite the great year he had. But when I personally talk about being confident about a division winner, I have to consider all the information and worst case scenario, consider there is a history of volatility in Cody Bellinger, despite the success he had, and you may need to account for that. And mm -hmm. to account for that in my mind is bringing in the equivalent of a Ben Zobris, bringing in the equivalent of someone who has Chris Bryant's offensive potential, which is easier said than done, but you can look at guys like Juan Soto or Pete Alonso, somewhere in the 375 plus weighted on base average plus Convince territory. Convince Cleveland to give you Jose Ramirez That's for some reason. That's never going to happen. I know, contracts. but I can dream <laughs> on it. never going to happen. Yeah. But this is really difficult for me to imagine. As you and I talk about this, as the episode keeps going on, <sighs> Like, well, wow. so it's, it's, you know, and, and let's, let's contrast it with someone that I know you've been watching in these playoffs and like a lot and Corbin Carroll in Arizona, right? Yeah, the first man. round pick. 
And the reason, just the reason I bring him up is sort of the difference. And again, why this is a tricky thing for the Cubs. So Corbin Carroll comes up in 2022. He ends up getting uh, 115 plate appearances across 32 games as a 21-year-old for Arizona. He puts up a 131 WRC+. That team is, is done. That team's out. They're not competing right? When he's doing this, Cubs aren't going to have that luxury, right? Like, yeah. so, so that's the thing. They got a small look again, coming into this year, they're, they're, they're only looking at 32 games, but he's a first round pick. He performed really well in those 32 games and they come into this year and they didn't have massive expectations, right? And he's allowed to kind of have this runway and look where he's gotten them, right? Um, that has more of those like kind of 2015 Cubs vibes, right? the 2023 and 2024 Cubs are in a different spot. PCA, for example, is in a different spot. He did not come up on a team that was almost 20 games under 500, you know, and get a chance to have 32 games where basically who cares if he's struggling, right? Long-term you would care, but like, as far as the team's performance, it's not, it's everybody's not living and and dying with this because the team is out of it, right? They don't have that luxury. And in 2024, again, they're not going to have that luxury because they had better have massive expectations or the off season was a failure, right? So it's, it's, I think it's a good conversation because it's a particularly tricky thing that the Cubs are going to have to figure out how to, how to deal with. In the, I like the Corbin Carroll uh, example, I think. If PCA can be Corbin Carroll, I, I would be ecstatic. I know our, our guy Cody Del Mendo was talking the same thing. The the difference between the two, not to compare them literally, but it does provide context of just the thought process for the Cubs and D backs. Corbin Carroll kinda had more of that offensive reserve, where PCA kinda has more of that like defensive reserve in terms of center fuel value. Corbin Carroll makes eighty percent contact, right? And in that 115 plate appearance sample in 2022, when the D-backs were struggling, he was struggling, but he made 74% contact, which is close to league average by about a few percentage points. So the the mountain for PCA to climb is much steeper than Corbin Carroll's mountain. And we need a Corbin Carroll-type contributor next season. It has to come through free agency or it has to come through trade. And the most likely route is it comes through trade, and then it opens up a whole new can of worms. Well, given where the Cubs' current roster is situated financially, contract-wise, Dansby Swanson's entering his 30s, Justin Steele is not too far away from his 30s, there may be a conversation to be had where it's like, Do you want to wait around for prospect development and play this risky game despite the high ceiling? Or, to your discomfort, even to my discomfort too, do you trade PCA and these higher prospect guys to shrink down that volatility? And whenever I mention the PCA trade potential, don't misconstrue what I'm saying here. The the potential value for him, I get it. The potential value for PCA. (laughs) is Dansby plus speed, and that's a six-win player. That's what BCA ceiling is, right? But if you want to align some of the other guys on the roster, it might be a difficult conversation to have. And I can see, I'm not advocating for it, I can see situations where there's opportunities to land a Juan Soto with the assumption you can extend them for PCA, and my idea would be if that is a possible price would be there, but... I know I'm just throwing out point. I'm yeah. throwing out you know crazy examples. If no, well, I will finish up the one. If there is the equivalent value of a Juan Soto for multiple years, let's say five years, you have to make that trade. Yeah, you I just mean, look. Do. Yeah, I mean, look, we've we've told people you know you may need to be prepared to bid farewell to some of these guys, right? Um, how you get to where the Cubs want to be is not a, 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 it's not an easy path. I mean, so hold on. Right? How do you feel about this though? Cause there's, it's, it's a weird conflict. About. Like we, about the Cubs, we're, we're optimistic yet. We have massive holes on this roster and we have, we're coming off a season where there is, 
no bullpen pitching development. There was good starting pitching development, but there were breaks. We just got rid of two guys integrated in that pitching infrastructure, and there's this weird imbalance in my mind. I feel good, but it's under the idea that Jets front office can make all these deals, and he hasn't been able to showcase he can do this yet. So am I supposed yeah. to come through this offseason starting feeling good about this? I don't think I – like, I don't know. I – I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I genuinely believe that they're going to try to get there. And maybe I'm a rude so for thinking that. Um, but I think they're going to spend and try to make the moves to get to the point where we feel like, you know, again, like uh, using other teams as a measuring stick is a, a difficult thing, right? But are we going to feel like they're the best team in baseball? Like, you know, probably not. But yeah. I feel like they are going to try to make the moves to get to the point where we feel like, yes, this is the best team in the NL Central. They had better win it or heads are going to roll because that's that's what this team looks like. And and beyond that, hopefully, right? Like and, and feeling like they have a legitimate playoff, not contender to make the playoffs, but succeed in the playoffs. I don't get paid to figure out how they're going to do it. So for now... I'm just floating along on the blind belief that they're going to try. And, you know, look, like Jed hasn't, you know, Jed hasn't won a playoff game as the Jed hasn't won anything as the president, right? He was not the president when the Cubs won, if you even count it, the 2020 NL Central. That was still Theo, right? Yeah. So Jed has sold off twice and bought unsuccessfully, right? Once. So he, he's got to get there. So again, I, you know, he gets paid big bucks to figure it out, but it is, you know, I think it's fair as people that talk about this team to acknowledge it's, it's not the clearest path, right? The clearest path is you pay Cody Bellinger and you pay Shohei Otani, right? And maybe you make some moves to fill out the bullpen or add a yeah. frontline starter, things like that. That's the clearest path, but you know. Wishful a, thinking, right? And and the problem with that is even if we were all just like, well, they sh they have the money, they should just do it. So do other teams, right? And maybe Cody Bellinger wants to go back to LA. Maybe he wants to play in New York and hit on the short porch. Maybe Shohei Otani doesn't want to move to Chicago, right? Like th there's things you can't control about that. So even if there was, uh, well, just do this, right? Like it, yeah. it's not that easy. It's not just something the Cubs control. So yeah. I, I think it's going to be tough. You know me though. I am not a prospect hugging person, right? Well, sure I believe in a like lot of that. Say what? Sure sounds like it today. Every time I bring up the PCA trade conversation, I'm not even floating the idea. You you torch me for it. I like you torch pressing me your for buttons. that. You know that. Sure, I guess. Um but there's guys I believe in or guys that, you know, I, I I would like to see them keep and try to develop and things like that. And I would I would be um, you know, worried, call it, if they traded them, like, how oh, are they going to regret that? Things like that. I, the only thing I care about always is that the major league Chicago Cubs are in the best position as possible and yeah. competing as one of the best teams in the league. I, I genuinely, I don't care how they get there. Uh, I know. So that, like that's my, that's my general feeling. I'm ready for whatever they're going to do because I only care that they win in the end. I only care that they're holding up the commissioner's trophy at the end of the year and at least competing for that on a serious level year in and year out. I don't yeah. care how they get there. I'm not attached to any of these guys, right? Like it, it does not matter to me. So I'm prepared for that. Um, that doesn't mean it's an easy task, right? Yeah. And putting all those puzzle pieces together is, is a difficult one. As your my my brain started to spin and snowball a little bit as you're mentioning Cody Bellinger and Shohei Otani, you know what if you sign both those guys Shohei Bellinger? There's your three four hitters. Go out, get Nola. There's your pitcher. Go out, okay. trade for Tyler Glasnow. We're done. We did it. PCA can start every game what, what in is center the field. Five hundred million dollars. I <laughs> we'll figure that out later, man. You know, like. Tom has a lot of money. I, and there I you will go. Say, You're done. I will say on air, if they did that, like, listen, <laughs> my season ticket rep can call me whenever they want, bump the price. They have my, you know, they have my card on file, whatever you guys want, right? Yeah. Just bump it up fivefold for you to pay. You don't care. Maybe that's, that's how you do it. 
You just agree. You have this pre-signed agreement with all Cub fans. We will pay five times more if that happens. Yes, if there Shohei Otani is playing for this team. And Cody Bellinger and right. Glasnow and Nolan. Right. So, yes. okay. Let right. me do this and last ad break here. Ooh, and that... Pete Alonso. Just get them all. You know what? You're right. You know, get everyone over. Trade everyone. Sign everyone. We're... <laughs> That's how Trade everyone. Right. That's how you do it. All right. Let's uh, finish these ad breaks here, and then I'll throw it back do to you. Do you think we'll ever do off. an episode ever again that's under an hour? I don't I mean, know, not. man. Well, the problem is, like, we don't have a producer, so it's just you and me you know, pressing these buttons. So I, I felt a little guilty with Joey and Steven for so many so many. Our wonderful uh, producers, yes. They're who great. Not, They're great. Who do not deserve having to sit through you Dude, and I's I inane felt conversations. so <laughs> bad for Joey on that yeah. last Sunday episode. I'm like, oh man, taking away from your football, your football weekend. But you know, that's why he's Joey. That's why he's a good producer. Yes. All right. Uh, so, with that in mind, you know, you can get other content besides listening to you and I, Corey. You can be a CHGO diehard podcast. The Bears, they won a game. Was it a, a week and a half ago on Thursday? Connor, I watched a hockey game uh, a couple of days ago. I watched. The first hockey game in years because of Connor Bedard. Yep. Uh, the CEA Shield Blackhawks guys are doing great content. Post-game shows and premium written content from our guys on CSU Cubs. Jared Willis, Ryan Herrera. I contribute with Ryan uh, every now and then. I, I give Ryan questions. I annoy the hell out of Ryan to ask these guys questions. And he does it. Uh, Maybe reluctantly, but he does it. And there's 20% off events if you are a diehard. There's dope merch for all teams. A free shirt if you do become a member. And you can join the members-only Discord, the CHGO Lounge. And for the next three tailgates, X Golf will be giving away a $200 gift certificate to any other Chicagoland locations. Find the X Golf nearest you at PlayXGolf dot com backslash Chicago land. Again, this is at the CHGO Bears tailgates. And finally, but certainly not least, Goose Island Beer Company. CHGO is supported by Goose Island. It's been Chicago's beer since 1988. Do you guys know the deal? They have a very deep beer roster. The Beer Hug family, my favorite, the 312 Wheat Ale, Full Pocket Pilsners, which is what Cody was chugging during those wins when the vibes were good. And now, October, they have the Oktoberfest. You can also grab Ultra Fresh Brewery exclusive beers at Goose Island's Original Brew House on Clybourne Avenue in Lincoln Park or from their tap room on Fulton Street in Westtown. Goose Island Beer Company, Chicago's Beer. All right, Brendan. Um, another hour? Like, what do you want to sure. do? Well, I mean, it's um, kind of late. Yeah, so the ALCS slated to start on Sunday. So we are, you know, moving through these playoffs. So again, just sort of reminding you, like, obviously, there's not going to be much Cubs news unless you, you know, get really riled up over them changing their bullpen. There's coach. always Cubs news. Come on. Um, but, you know few more series left. We got the championship series and then of course the world series. Uh, and then things will, you know, really start in earnest, right? You're going to have arbitration, tendering guys, contracts, things like that. We're going to get the GM yep. meetings, winter meetings, uh, you know, and then ultimately obviously guys are able to sign. Um, I I'm looking forward personally to like the daily sweat of every single mention of Cody Bellinger on the internet. <laughs> I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Really good for my mental health. Yeah, don't you sure. think? Uh, for mine too. Yes, of course. Yes, just like every because, like, I I knew it was going to happen when I was going into the studio. Uh, what was that Wednesday with mm -hmm. Cody and Ryan? Uh, like like the right Instagram post. As yeah, as I was on the train <laughs> uh, heading to the West Loop here in Chicago, Cody Bellinger posted a, a one sentence thank you to the Cubs, their fans for treating his family right and, and being a great atmosphere and all that other stuff. And I, I said to Cody, when I got to the office, I was like, those mentions are going to be a dumpster, a dumpster yeah. fire. And boy, and they were they, were. they <laughs> were, as you predicted, he's gone. He's going aye, back to LA. Aye. He's a Yankee already. Things like I that. I know. I don't know. I know. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I wouldn't read too much into stuff like that, but it's just an illustration of, he, he does seem like somewhat of a, a linchpin to 
this Cubs offseason. Again, they don't have to go through Cody Bellinger. In this scenario we just laid out, if you just trade for Juan Soto and Pete Alonso and yeah. sign Shohei Otani, well, you don't need him. Right and, and sign Aaron Nola and Tyler, and Trevor, uh, Tyler Glasgow. My favorite thing is yeah. that I know there's at least like one person who genuinely believes you and I think that that. Well, I'm being 100 percent serious. Is, is possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't have to do that, but it does. You know, again, it does feel very tricky uh, without him, right? Yes. Uh, but I I do look forward to that of of every mention. You know. Uh, oh, he he followed the Yankees on Twitter, you know, on on Instagram. Well, that would Does be that significant. mean right? that would be actually significant news? Well, but no, then that. you always get the people, the sleuths, who are like, he was already following them. Like, that, you know, true. he liked a poster that was four years ago. That's true. Anyway, that's just the general timeline of things. Um, other than that, I I don't really expect too much to happen between the time you and I speak again. Um, I would invite you to check out, uh, you know, Luke, Cody, Ryan uh, will be with you Monday through Thursday. Um, we had a good conversation with your friend Rich. Uh, yeah. Rich Beasterfield. Yeah. Actually, um, I forgot to mention this. I did listen to that show that you guys did. Very mean what you said about me at the end, you know. I you only say that stuff that. to see if you listen. Yeah, I listened. I was yeah. offended by it. But Rich, the good friend he is, said. Wouldn't quote, stand for it. Would not stand yeah. for. He said, "Quote: Brendan is a good friend of mine." And by the way, by the way, I when we and I hung out, he's the one who offered. I didn't even offer. So he's a good guy, a better man than me. I did. I uh, did. I did. When I went to go watch some of those Cubs players and everything, watch them practice, I got confused as a player the very first time. I told you this, right? Yeah. All right. The show's <laughs> over. Just at, just end it. I'm done. I'm getting up. <laughs> they asked me what time's practice. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, are you playing? I'm like, no, I'm not playing. But yeah, they confused me. Um, Which I understand. But yeah, check out our our conversation with Rich. Uh, that was on Wednesday. Uh, they had Max Bain, Cubs prospect. That I know he cool. had some, you know, really, I think, insightful stuff, you know, on like Cade Horton and just the, the nicest experience. guy, by the way. We got to talk yeah, to Max, Max uh, is great. in Arizona. It's super nice guy. Yeah, yeah, always rooting for Max um, and always good to hear from him. But uh, the crew will be with you every day. Um, and like Brendan said, uh, very, very proud to be a part of the the entire CHGO team. The The Bears team is relentless, dude. I, I, they are they crank out so much content and it's it's all just uh, amazing. I, I feel like um, I, I can't imagine that there's it's possible to have better coverage uh, than the CHGO Bears team. Um, the way that they they do that is is really amazing, um, and hopefully you know at some point the the Cubs are in the playoffs and we can do stuff like that. Um, yeah, you know at that level, um, as you said, Connor Bedard, the Blackhawks team, uh, working tirelessly to cover uh, a rising star in the city of Chicago. Um, so always check out allchgo.com. Subscribe to the CHGO Sports YouTube channel. Uh, Brendan and I will be with you next Friday. Uh, hope Friday the 13th treated you well, maybe reversed any curses that you have. I'm not really sure how all that works. But um, as I said, you know, not live, but leave us comments feedback, questions, if there's topics you want us to cover, especially in this off season where we're, you know, waiting for action to kick in, let us know things you'd like us to talk about, um, things you don't want us to talk about anymore. Um, let us know. We, we're going to read through those comments. We appreciate you guys interacting with the chat. If you can hit that thumbs up, the like button on your way out. We appreciate it. CHU Cubs crew will be back with you uh, on Monday, Luke, Cody, and Ryan uh, for another full week of the CHGO Cubs podcast. So we appreciate you guys tuning in. Brendan and I will talk to you next Friday. Uh, and as always, go Cubs. We all silly like the mayor. 